first we have um, on my list is Derek Butsoy, who's the co-founder of Action for Equality Africa. And he works to promote positive fatherhood, gender equality, and end sexual and gender-based violence in Ghana. If you want people's uh, fuller CVs, you can look on the website. Uh, next on my list is Michael Conroy. And the line I've taken out of his CV is his commitment to facilitate constructive dialogue about ending violence, rejecting unsafe behaviours and delegitimizing disrespectful cultural messages about the relative value of women and girls. And he's been doing this work for a very long time. Next, Mark Hegarty, a co-founder of What Can I Do? formed in the aftermath of the murder of Sarah Everard uh, with Gary Taylor Naya, and they're based in Wales. And the joyful thing I get from Mark's CV is he started a journey of listening, understanding, learning, and sharing. And we all need to do that. The fourth member is the very dynamic Vicky Robertson, the founder of Kaleidoscope uh, in 2019. And in 2019, she was the first to petition, petition to get mandatory domestic abuse training for everyone involved in the family court <coughs> system. She's doing loads of other stuff as well. Um, and if you want to know more, you'll have to contact her directly. And finally, the co-founder of uh, engage the conference, Bjorn Sutka, uh, first introduced to feminism by his partner in 2009, a member of the London pro-feminist men's group and contributor to the anti-porn men project. Now, we are making a recording of this, um, and so I have to bring that to your attention. If you don't want to be part of the recording, um, then please say so. Um, now, those are the one line introductions, and they all deserve one page hour of introductions. And I'm just going to spend a minute saying why did we start Engage? We started it because we wanted to be involved with doing actions, not words. Um, I've been to lots and lots and lots of conferences. And we were very pleased that today we did our first action, which involved a demonstration in London and a demonstration in Manchester at the courts to protest the appalling conviction rates of uh, the courts on rape and sexual violence. And Bjorn will probably say a little bit more like that about that during his presentation. Uh, the other reason we started is because we wanted to involve more men. And we, I went to my last pro-feminist men's conference about 40 years ago. And we thought it was about time we started to start this journey again. So that is the reason we we've got this weekend of events for the next three days. And we welcome you to listen to all the other events that are taking place. It's not easy to end men's violence against women and girls, but it's easy to start to end men's violence against women and girls. Just do it, just to do something. And if we can persuade more people who are listening to actually take a little action and then listen to the response. Ask women, was that the right thing to do? Listen to their response and then react appropriately. We are making progress. Um, I'm going to stop there and be, because we are now just about back to the right time. And I'm going to invite Bjorn Sutka, my my co-founder of Engage UK to talk about 
engage and respond with thoughts on why it's important for men to organise. Over to you. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much for, for that, Chris. Um, I just hope that everyone can see me. Um, it's the first time I'm, you know, we've organised something online. So if there's any issues and you can't see the speaker, then um, do let us know. Um, I'm going to keep it really short. I think for me, um, you know, when when I've been speaking to Chris, the thing that became really apparent is that um, there isn't really men out there publicly who are being active in um, talking about ending male violence against women in the sense that there's no protests that are being organized by men. Um, and it feels like if, if this is something that we want to take full responsibility for, um, then we need to you know, take that responsibility by organizing our own things. And I, I had a brilliant um, quote from um, Fiona Vera Gray the other day who said, you know, men should just jump in and try and do something. And if they get it wrong, then that's fine. And they can just go back and work on that. And I think that's what we're hoping and aiming to do um, because it's, it's not enough if we're just, um, you know, sitting at home talking to our friends, we need to do things more actively. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why we started. And I think today was, um, was a start with the protests. Um, we did talk um, to quite a few people walking past. We also made some connections with men that, you know, felt the same way as us. They felt compelled to go out and show um, their feelings and um, their commitment to try and help end male violence against women. And I think that is a good start and hopefully something that we can build on so we can do more of that um, in years to come. So yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, I missed some of that audio. Is, are you, is that you done? Yeah. Okay, fine. That means we're bang on time. I will say the reason we're keeping it short and keeping everybody, all people who could talk for an hour a day, um, just to five minutes, is to give lots of time for Q&A from the audience. Um, and if we do that, we'll be very pleased. So now on my speaking list, it's over to Vicky Robertson from Kaleidoscope. Vicky, hello. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Vicky Firstly, thank you for um, arranging such a groundbreaking event and hearing everything that you're doing and everything that you all do daily. Um, I would just like to firstly say thank you because it's really vital. Um, as you kindly mentioned, I am the founder of Kaleidoscopic UK. Now, Kaleidoscopes, I'm hoping that people are old enough to remember, but down the viewpoint, you can see broken pieces, but they make beautiful colours um, from the shattered pieces. So it's about turning the lens on domestic abuse in all areas. It's about finding colours and new patterns. Um, and that abuse may change us, but it doesn't have to define us. So that's a little description of where we're from. As Chris mentioned, founded this in 2019 and quickly realised that some of our thresholds can be big barriers for people accessing support in all forms of areas. Um, so we are actually threshold free as well because any form of abuse has impacts that are usually very long lasting. So just want to again say thank you for everyone attending this event as well because actually together it does create ripple from all the speakers that you're here tonight and the incredible lineup it will create change but we need more of it. So when I was asked to talk about why it's important for men to engage in this conversation and actually take action, the simple answer is because change will not happen without it. Women have been trying for centuries to change it, but sadly, it won't happen without men being involved. We need men at every area, stage, and actually men in power to implement change and be proactive not just listening, but actually being active because we need upstanders, not bystanders. And it may be really, really hard to tackle, but as you've already heard, it is possible and together, 
our voices are so much louder. So rather than working against each other and an us and them, if we could all join in the conversation, things would definitely change. Men listen to men predominantly. So a great example I had from a client actually was, and I've spoken to many women about this from a woman's perspective. When you are being hit on, for example, by a man, you can give every reason why you're not interested. But actually the majority will only listen if you make up even an invisible boyfriend or husband because men respect other men. They don't necessarily respect a woman's right or choice. And we are not saying all men at any stretch of the imagination. As we know, I'm surrounded by incredible men this evening, but it takes all men to be involved at every stage and it affects all women. This is the point. Men are imperative to ending male violence against women and girls. So often our language as well has an impact. You will notice that so often you'll hear vorg, which is actually just violence against women and girls. Accountability from males is actually abolished. And through our conversations, you will see a lot of victim blaming through the terminology. So that for me would be a great place to start. Our language has impacts. I was very much brought up around boys will be boys, or if a boy was mean to you in the playground, it's because he liked you. What that does is it conditions women and girls. We become conditioned to accept the unacceptable. We are victim blamed, and again, the accountability is removed. So often we hear it referred to as jokey banter or locker room banter or any of which ways it's explained away. But actually the end result of violence has a beginning point and that's where we need to start calling it out. So we can make changes from the very beginning. We need male leaders, as I've mentioned, to stand up. Education obviously plays a part, but so does calling it out. So when you hear that jokey banter, we all have a choice, whether we are upstanding or bystanders. One in three women are subjected to abuse or violence throughout their lifetime, that's reported. Two women a week are killed at the hands of a partner or ex-partner, but it doesn't just start with murder, it starts long before. 72 billion pounds per year is spent on domestic abuse alone in the UK. We encourage people to leave these relationships, but actually in that we use the victim blaming terminology of why didn't she leave sooner? Why does she stay? What was she wearing? Why did she take that route? And then we put in things like apps to keep people safe or women to feel safer. What we need to feel safer is the conversations to change, the language to change, but action to happen. So I'd just like to say again, when we encourage people to leave, we need to have the networks that support them and not the misogynistic society that sadly we have. Because 87% of those who leave uh, in 2017 that were murdered at the hands of a partner or ex-partner is within one month of leaving. So actually, if we're encouraging people to leave, we need to be backing up the support that we have in place. Men are imperative to this change, as I've said, along with language. We are not anti-men. So often when women speak out, we are viewed just as that, as men haters, as we are obnoxious or we are damaged or it's our mental health overreacting. But when men speak out, it's very different and we truly, truly need you. This will not change without you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky. Very wise words and important words. Um, and it's great to have your support and you're, you're doing fantastic work there. We know that. All power to your elbow. Okay. Um, now on my speaker list, it's straight over to Derek. And we're all keeping remarkably to time. Thank you very much, everybody, so far. Derek. Hi, Chris. Are you there? Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Good evening. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, that's good to know. Now, let me start off by 
um, tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Derek Butchery, and we are here in Ghana, West Africa. And uh, I co-founded White Ribbon Ghana, and now we call we called Action for Equality Africa because we've now opened up our scope. We want to deal with issues of positive fatherhood. We want to get into issues of men's health alongside working to end male violence against women. So we now action for equality Africa. Now we started off in 2008 in working with men in various regions across Ghana to understand the importance of their contribution to ending violence against women in Ghana. Let me share a little statistics with you, then I can go into why men must organize to end violence against women. Now in Ghana in 2020, August 2020, Statistics from the Domestic Violence and Victim Support Unit of the Ghana Police indicates that at least 31.9% of women in Ghana faces some form of violence, 31.9%. Uh, and that's quite a number. And we are not decreasing, but we are increasing. And that is to tell you that we have a lot of work to do. There are a lot of women activists that are working in this space to be able to reduce this, but it's not working out. And that was why I was challenged with another person to start engaging men on issues of violence in our country. And over the period we've done a bit, I also want to mention here that uh, we've had some support and uh, collaboration from Mr. Green in all the works we do from some time now. And that is good to mention also. So all in all, uh, we've done some bit of work here. We've been, we've been able to organize men uh, in, in networks to be able to Nadi. talk, to be able to connect, to be able to discuss issues that okay. will change. Uh, yeah. Uh, that will change. Can, can you hear me? Something with my computer. It's, he's almost finished. Okay. Back. So now let right. me get into the issue of why men must engage to end violence against women. Now, in the period of my work from 2008 till now, I've realized that we've never talked to any men group or men organization or even any men association in Ghana that don't see the importance of working together to end violence against women. And that is to say that a good number of men understand that it is important to end male violence against women. Now, the issue is that until we get together and we have a strong force, we have a strong mind to end violence in Africa and all across the world, we might not be able to do that because as long as we still have that minute number of men that are, that are happy in perpetrating violence, we might not be able to deal with the situation. So I, I believe that it's important for men to get together, organize and work together because the number of good men that understands the importance of ending violence of, uh, against women is far more than the number that perpetrates violence all across the world. So if good men will not keep quiet, if good men will not sit down and allow um, other people to destroy uh, the image of men, then it is important that we all get together, organize, and make sure we have a positive voice, make sure we have a solid voice to indicate to other men, especially those that are happy perpetrating violence against women, that ordinarily majority of us are not in favor of violence against women. And if we are able to organize and have that solid voice, I'm certain and sure that we can go far and the message can, can, can go across to as many men and even to the perpetrators of violence to be able to change their minds. It's also very important to know that in Ghana, even in our parliament, let me share a statistic a statistic with you. It's only 14.5% 14 .5 of our parliamentarians or the legislature that are women. And that is to even tell you that still in Ghana, men are dominant in various positions, positions of decision-making, positions of, uh, of legislature and making of policy are all dominated by men. So if we organize and if we are able to organize and get these men to understand the importance of men engagement to end violence against women, then we are sure that policies and programs can be done or can be put in place because still, I can tell you, even at the local 
at the, at the traditional and societal level where norms, social norms are formed, the, the society and communities are ruled by men called chiefs in our country. And these chiefs are the custodians of our culture. And until we organize and get men to understand the importance of their contribution to ending violence against women, and they are able to take these various educations to the, to, to the grassroots, to the ground level, to their communities where norms, social norms are formed, you might not make changes. And most importantly, for the legislation and other policies, we need to work with men. And that is why as long as we are able to get more men involved, as long as we are able to get more men to get to the understanding of their contribution to the fact that men can stand up and I, I, I realize that it is not just that violence against women is men issue, it's just women issue. It concerns men. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, men are the solution. Because if we're able to get men to understand and change from some social norms and some other issues of masculinity that enforces or perpetrates uh, violence against women, we are a step above. So I think that it's important for men to organize and not only organize at the grassroots level, but organize to organize to policy levels, organize to legislature, le legislating levels where people can make laws and policies that can change some of these things that are engaged. A lot of, a lot of activities and actions happen in Ghana and they, a lot of people, the, the perpetrators get away with it because the right policies, the right legislations that are supposed to be in place to make sure that we can violence against women and all that because if we are able to organize more, get organized more men across the world and we have a solid voice and get people in authority to be able to understand this, then we are moving forward. I was thinking about that's, something that's, I, I was thinking about something and I want to share that quickly before I I, um, I think my time is even getting up. So yeah, I'll be very fine. quickly. <laughs> yes, very quickly. Today is International Men's Day. In Ghana, as a matter of fact, International Toilet Toilets Day has taken over the International Men's Day. International Toilets Day is also today, and it's making waves in the media in all other spaces. The International Men's Day. I was even shocked that some media houses don't even know that it's International Men's Day. Why? Because the man over the years have been seen as not very, uh, not being the best in terms of. Uh, some issues in our society, and that's why International Men's Day doesn't get a recognition. Fathers, they don't get a recognition. If men are ready to work together and redeem the image of uh, the man race, then it will be good for all of us. And I think we will go far, far and get issues ag uh, around violence against women solved all across the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Derek and well done and we look forward to working with you in action for equality africa some more um i'd like now to invite the very experienced michael conroy he's very experienced so i'm sure he can fit his remarks into five minutes well done michael hi uh thanks very much uh really nice to hear vicky and then derek Re really good to be involved in this thank you very much chris and bjorn uh, so it's five minutes i'll keep my own the time i'll stop at 18 21 for sure um i was trying to share screen there but i think that maybe has been a little bit over ambitious there so i'm not going to bother wasting anybody's time with that <laughs> um, I, I i can't see me i'm assuming you can see me and, and if not it doesn't really matter you ain't missing anything whatsoever so uh, as long as you can hear me uh, <laughs> hopefully that that will do um my name is michael conroy i set up um uh, a thing which is really just me to be honest it's a training company called uh, men at work two years ago i've been working in secondary education for 16 years uh, that's coming to an end uh, this month and i will be going full-time training uh, teachers youth workers people who work in social work uh, family support um, around having constructive dialogues with boys and young men um, to kind of explore the messages that the kind of incredible amount of um, constant cultural and social messages to which boys and young men are exposed from the moment they're born um, around what it means to be a man. You know, the great, the great mystery, the great burden, the great, 
the great thing that we're supposed to be, uh, which is very, very, very different to what women are supposed to be. Apparently, according to all the stories, uh, we are materially different. We, we are our sex is different. Yes. But after that, we've got thousands of years of conditioning and we are caught in the eye of that. And boys are trying to make sense of it you know I, our our sons our nephews the, the the boys that we work with they're trying to make sense of the role that is being offered to them the roles perhaps in plural the expectations the permissions the entitlements and how that how they differ from those that are being offered to girls in multiple cultures this is not just in the uk you know these are kind of deep cultural kind of global questions about power and about value so uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the work I work in schools I work with social services local authorities to enable people uh, professionals to have con con uh, conversations dialogues meaningful constructive dialogues with boys and young men about finding their way through all of these messages kind of finding their way safely into adulthood um, and how to kind of understand that lots of the messages that we're exposed to or they're exposed to are not in their interests genuinely although they may offer very shiny things like being in charge and being the decision maker and being the boss but genuinely as a human being they're not in our, their interests and they're very certainly not in the interests of women and girls because this construction this incredible kind of sophisticated um, cultural concoction of masculinity is built at the express cost to women and, and girls because uh, that's the whole point of it is to maintain power so uh, I'm very interested in issues around male mental health I'm a, I'm a trained mental health uh, instructor I work every day just about every day with boys and young men uh, who are experiencing issues, but also whose behaviour is is causing uh, is cause for concern, perhaps, or who are merely kind of growing up in families where domestic abuse is an issue. So uh, I've got one minute left. It's super quick, but I'm very happy to be here. But I genuinely believe that men not only should get involved. I think we are. We, we are. We are collectively the only way that we can end the problem because we're the ones who pose and create the problem by this kind of will to dominate, the desire to be unempathetic, the desire to be distant and different. And that is a real problem and it doesn't help anybody. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm here to talk. Drop us an email, get in touch tonight, whatever. Uh, but going forward, let's create some alliances and conversations and dialogues because we've got to work with our boys and young men to keep them safe from themselves and from other boys and young men and also to keep women and girls safe, not in a protective kind of paternalistic way, but as respectful fellow human beings. And the focus is on let's be human and humane. And, and that's me done. I've got to bang in two quick comments on that before we move on to uh, Mark Hegarty from What Can I Do? First, first comment is that uh, men at work have got some brilliant training packs um, available from their website. So that's a plug for your work. But the other thing is talking about being um, too isolated or be it the fact that being one person doing the work on your own is... Yeah, it's crazy. I could I list about 15 organizations of men who are doing work around the issues. Mm. And we really need to be getting together and speaking one voice. But we that's that's an issue for for another day, and maybe during the course of the weekend we'll be able to talk about that a little bit more. So now right. I'd like to invite or during the question period, maybe Mark. Uh, now I'd love to invite Mark Hegarty from What Can I Do? for your five minutes and then we'll move on to questions to everybody. Okay, hi, can you, I'm not sure if you can see me. We can. 
Yeah, you can. Anyway. You're right. Okay, okay. So, sorry about the view. <laughs> so, my name is Mark Hegarty, and I'm the co founder of Wicked What Can I Do? I'm a 51 year old bloke. I'm a son, a brother, a father of an 18 year old daughter who's my world. And like everybody else, I'm horrified by the deaths of Sarah Everard, Sabrina Nessa, and so many others. It just goes on and on. And back in March, a female friend of mine jokingly said, What's it like being the enemy? referring to me being a middle-aged man. Later that day, I went running. And when I saw a lady walking alone in my path, I just did not know what, I didn't know what to do. If I sped up a ramp past her, I might frighten her. If I hung back, it might freak her out and frighten her. So I froze, which also looked suspicious. All I wanted to do was run past her. And all she wanted to do was get to where she needed to go. And I just did not know what to do. It's crazy. So I shared this story with my friend, Gary Taylor Nea, who's a preacher, a teacher, and a survivor. And she spends every day helping and supporting women who are victims of domestic abuse, collecting them from hospitals, taking them to police stations, organizing self how it's safe, safe houses for them and their children on a daily basis. We spoke for over an hour and in no uncertain terms, she told me that now is the time for men to stand up side by side with women to try and reduce violence against women and girls. And at that moment, Wicked was formed. I had no idea what I could do. So I just started educating myself. Firstly, I looked for male voices working towards eradicating violence against women and girls. And they are out there but they weren't easy to find. I found Nazir Lavzal, who later became one of our patrons alongside Rachel Williams and Sutba. I found Jackson Katz and urged everyone to look at his TED talk, Violence Against Women. It's a man's problem. It was a game changer for me. I found White Ribbon, Beyond Equality, Token Men, all of whom carry out incredible work on gender equality on ending violence against women and girls. Now, as a youngster in the 80s, I remember hearing the N-word in the schoolyard. And by the time I got to college, it was the deplorable term it is today. So something happened in that time. And I believe that we are at a point in time where we can make simple changes that will work towards reducing violence against women and girls. As a youngster in the 80s, I was never told how I should act in a relationship or how I should treat a partner. I'm lucky because my parents have been married for 56 years and my father still treats my mother like a princess and I'm fortunate to have that ground in. So far, Wicked has hosted numerous roundtable events with survivors, with men under 30, with men over 30. We've spoken to leaders, campaigners of both genders and my eyes have been opened. When I walk home at night, I only consider the holy trinity of my wallet, my phone and keys and the, the quickest route home. As a man, I don't have to consider what I'm wearing. If anyone has been attacked on this route, how to protect myself, I don't have to worry about getting raped. I have learned that there are a long list women need to consider before walking home. I've learned that 97% of women will be subject to some kind of abuse from name calling up to homicide. I've learned that over 95% of the 400,000 plus sexual assaults carried out on women in the last year were by men. I've also seen the look of pain in the eyes of survivors as they shared their experiences and now understand how they deal with this fear on a daily basis. I've also seen the look of horror on men's faces when you share this information, the thought that their daughter, sister, mother, grandmother, auntie, in fact, any female in their lives have to deal with this field throughout their lives. I'm nothing special. I'm just a normal bloke. And I only learned this by talking and listening, not listening to respond, but listening with an intent to understand. And it's through this engagement that I have began to understand that to make changes to end violence against women, women and men have to work together. We have to respect each other. We have to stand up and walk together. By listening, learning and engaging and considering, we can all make changes that can prevent these attacks. This won't happen by shouting or by preaching, but by talking and listening. 
Wicked are working on a nationwide campaign aimed at men over 35 to show how they can help make women feel safe. Men over 35 have a huge circle of influence. They have children, grandchildren, partners, wives, mothers, sisters, brothers and friends and colleagues. Following that, we aim to bring workshops to male dominated blue collar workplaces where we will talk face to face, where they will hear directly from a survivor how a throw away misogynist comments, which isn't supposed to, can give to can give the green light for a man to grab a woman and inflict a life sentence of fear. I truly believe there is great momentum for men to stand up alongside women and finally make individual behavioral changes that can lead to significant reductions to violence against women in our lifetime. I urge you to support us or just to follow our journey and talk to your male friends, family members, because we all agree that, in a, that a world where women and girls feel safe has to be a better world. And we all have the power to make this happen. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Diach. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, now, I would, we're running a li little bit late, but we've still got plenty of time for questions. We can overrun a fraction. Um, so, uh, I've got one question for Michael specifically. Do you work? For with police and crime commissioners. Um, uh, think... Oh crikey! I, I'm in the throw. I, I attended uh, West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner um, workshop last week, which was because um, I've, I'm trying to deliver something called Becoming Respectful, which is a perpetrator program, uh, one to one and group work, but which I should be doing in Manchester in 2022 uh, but i'd like to be uh involved in stuff in the birmingham area west midlands uh so police and crime commissioner um not currently i'm i submitted a, a statement of interest to work there uh but i'm 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 open to anything i'm open to anything until i'm late 60s knackered or die before then i'm i'm here for anything doors open i don't you know, I've got no no filters. I will work with anybody, uh, and I will do my best to try and uh, do what I can. So yeah, police and crime. I I don't I don't uh, have any antipathy towards police and crime commissioners. Let's put it that way. I'm sure some of them are very nice people, uh, but I'm sure some of them are not. In fact, some of them are definitely not. Like the recent North Yorkshire one who had to resign because of his outrageous comments about the uh, uh, lack of street wiseness, which he thought contributed to uh, murder. And so some of them are good, some of them are bad. I'm here, I'm here to talk to anyone. The next question I've got is to all the panel. So very quickly from every single one of the panel, are we making progress? Uh, is life getting better? And if not, um, what are the things that we can do better? And what are the things that we need to do even better? Okay, I can, can I take the first one? I, I, I do think I do think that we are um, there is most definitely momentum uh, of men standing up and listening. There is momentum in the media of acknowledgement that men understand that it is our problem. Um, how can we improve it by listening, working, combining together and talking, in my opinion? And who's next on that? Yeah, I'm happy to go if that's all right. Um, I would agree with everything Mark's just said. It takes um, a holistic approach, but I think there's all something we can all do. So whether that's getting involved with your local domestic abuse forum, or writing, you know, lobbying your MPs, or finding out what your work policy is and procedures, um, and you know, white ribbon accreditation, obviously. Um, and all those sorts of things that you can get involved with um, and anyone can do. So I think definitely is progressing. I think obviously the new Domestic Abuse Act as well has massively helped. Um, but keeping the conversations going and obviously the 16 days of activism is a great tool to um, promote and yeah, basically um, get out there as much as you can and obviously interact. 
So here, here I can I can say that um, certainly we we are not there yet, but I have seen uh, a worldwide uh, determination by all organizations that work in this space to make positive change, and that is the most important. As long as we give up and as long as we are ready to bring along all other men, I see a better picture ahead that we will get there certainly. For, for us, talking about issues of masculinity and talking about issues that uh, works against our culture that helps in the perpetration of violence is quite technical in Africa. So that has been one of the hurdles that we have dealing with issues that pertain to toxic masculinity, issues that pertain to issue, uh, issues that pertains to social norms, that is you coming against the culture and tradition of the people. And that is where Africa might have some challenges. I don't know about the UK and the other parts of the world, but yes, these are challenges, but certainly we are sitting and calculating and recalculating and looking at appropriate means of overcoming this so we can make greater impact. Because as long as we are determined and can make impact with our work, violence against women will be something we can all conquer across the world. And I've got a very specific question for you, Derek, um, from one of the listeners talking, saying, uh, what is the age of marriage and sexual consent? And I, that's particularly apposite for me because I remember when I was visiting you, we did visit um, a project working around that. Certainly, uh, issues of consent and, and uh, now let me state here that in another part of Ghana, which is more dominant by the by the houses and excuse me to say the Muslim, child marriage has been an issue that we're working seriously against. And men very old, as old as their grandfathers getting to marry 15 years old, 12 years old, has been an issue here in our country, especially at the northern part of our country. Fact is that 18 years, Ghana, you you are it's, a, it's accepted for you to be able to get married after 18. So anything that happens between the age of zero to 18 is, is not, uh, it cannot be said to be consensual. And after 18 years, people are allowed to have consensual sex and other things. And from 18, people are allowed, women or girls are allowed to be able to get married. And that is what happens here in Ghana. It's 18 years and above. Thank you for, for that. Um, Anyone else want to comment on the uh, what, where are we making progress and what, what are we doing well, what do we need to do better? Uh, can I, I very quickly say that I think in some ways we're actually going backwards um, and I think that is really sad, uh, but I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think uh, across the world we're going forward, coming backwards, staying still. I don't think there is a general trend. We, we can point to successes, of course, but I, I'm very uncomfortable as a man saying whether things are getting better or not, because uh, my, my experience is not really relevant. I think, I, I think you know, we've got to ask women that question. And women are still fighting everywhere. We fight, they're fighting for uh, their w rights in the workplace. They're fighting for safety in the streets, their safety in the home. Um, and I, I, I honestly, because I, I work every day with boys and young men, I honestly think that the pro propaganda of porn is taking us backwards and that we're at an unusual time in history where um, I would say 90% of young people, young men particularly, and boys who are who are connected online, and that is most of the people in, in most of the people in the world, I'm thinking, I don't think I'm, going, I'm at so far uh, wrong in saying that, uh, are receiving their de facto sex education from a, a global porn industrial complex which sees women as meat for the meat grinder and, and has got very, very uh, poor kind of um, values and beliefs and which are instilling them in a new generation. And I think that is actually going to take us backwards and uh, I'm sorry to kind of uh, n not give a very positive picture there but if, if we genuinely engage and I'm sure Robert Jensen Bob Jensen later will talk about this in some detail about the the impact of raising children with porn and by porn to understand intimacy is an absolute catastrophe 
um, and that is not good news. I'd say hear here to that, absolutely. And I, I, I share your slightly pessimistic approach and actually the fact that actually it's not up to us to, to comment. But two, two questions which are both come from Sorry, Chris, listeners. Um Sorry, Chris, I just um, wanted to maybe say yeah. something in addition to what Michael just said. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you'll, you'll probably have more knowledge on the keeping men engaged bit over time because all of the work that you've done with White Ribbon. But I think, you know, you know Michael is really right to point out the, the impact of um, things like online pornography. And, you know, I'm probably the first generation of boys who grew up with that. You know, we got the internet in 1997 and here we are 23, 24 years later and it's still the same um, where, you know, none of the laws surrounding protecting children from what they see are really, you know, enforced. The same goes for things like Equal Pay Act, which has been there for 50 years, but nothing's happened with that. So there's a lot of um, things that haven't really been followed through. Um, but also, you know, in a lot of ways, things are getting worse. My partner reminded me, um, you know, as we're coming up to um, today that, you know, in the 70s, second wave feminists went to the streets protesting the fact that the rape conviction rate was 30 percent and now it's 1.6 percent. You know, things have gotten much, much worse in, you know, all stayed as bad as they were in in ways so yeah I just wanted to add that really yeah can yeah. we move on to another a couple of questions uh, there's death coming in thick and fast now um, and I'm also aware of the time okay two things um, one somebody says can we all commit to an intersectional approach to this movement um, to make commitment to consider how white supremacy heteronormity, uh, transphobia and ableism may be present in some of our work, um, sometimes unbeknown to us. And, uh, that, and the second question, which I sort, sort, will bang them both in and people might like to combine their answers, is uh, about can we all think of one thing, and this is for me is crucial, uh, what practical things have worked in engaging men? one concrete example from each of the panelists um, and given the fact that we want to be action oriented i think that's that's crucial for me and i'm going to le let the panelists comment on that. okay I'm, I, I'll, I'll jump in first if that's okay because um, wicked is a new organization and i'm on a, um, a a personal kind of journey myself so you know i so i'm i'm my i'm the audience and I can tell you something that, that really stuck with me is when you talk to directly to a survivor and they tell their stories, they tell you how when someone grabbed them or when someone criticized them or when someone was horrible to you, look at you, look at them face to face when they've been abused, look at them. And I think that when you actually see that look in your eyes and you think that could be my daughter and an image that stands out for me is in our discussions was one chap was telling us how he was looking over at his 18 month old daughter and the thought came in his mind, when is she going to be abused? Because she will be abused. Now that for me is powerful. And I think any decent bloke and the majority of men are decent. If that doesn't strike a chord and get you thinking about things, then nothing will. Must be. Chris, could you remind me of the question again, please? Sorry. Chris, I don't know if anybody can. Could you just re rephrase the question? Or the first, the first one was was about intersectionality, and oh, the that, second okay. one was was about um, one really practical uh, uh, intervention that we can engage in to engage men. Okay, I'll do the first thing uh, and I'll, I'll very quickly deal with the second. The first thing is uh, be authentic in our work with other men and with boys. Be authentic, be in the room, do not consider ourselves better than or expert in, but just that we've all been exposed to deeply, deeply powerful 
uh, and endless kind of social conditioning. That is what gender is, which is why uh, some men have just called me transphobic. Mate, you've picked the wrong geezer. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. I am not phobic, fearful or hateful. Hateful. I absolutely stand by. Gender is social conditioning. It's the propaganda of the patriarchy. And, and that's that. Thanks. And a practical activity for us to do? Me? Oh, I think I said be authentic in our work with boys and men. Authentic and not assume the mantle of expert, but that we're all born on a planet which is messed up. It was broke when we found it, and we need to, <laughs> and we need to uh, uh, basically, together, in a very kind of honest way, walk through the messaging, unpick it, identify it for what it is, and and try and support each other in a kind of fraternal way of exploring the messages to which we've all been exposed. So I think that's positive. Yeah, I'd I, like to add to that if possible as well. Completely agree. And on Mark's point, as a survivor of child um, abuse, where I was removed from domestic violence and then again 13 years having my own children in a similar situation, it, it is when you're authentic. I think that's when you have the breakthrough moments and you see that look of recognition coming in. But I also believe it's engagement. So engage, finding out what works for them. So assumptions don't work. You know, one size does not fit all, whether that's recovery as a survival, or engaging with somebody around this, this topic. is actually being hands-on will work for some people, information works for others. So actually covering lots of different bases and finding out what is the best way to engage with that individual? So I am also of the view that being authentic and understanding that we are just able to help correct some ills that we've identified in this whole issue of violence against women and trying to do our best to fix it is the way to go. We had a, a training session uh, about, uh, that's in August, this year. And I think what worked well for us was to be able to get a survivor to share her story. And it changed the whole setting and changed the mindset of the people that attended the training. They all got the feeling that there's a need for men to do more when the survivor share her story. And that story of Melissa has stuck in the mind of many, many of the people that attended this training. And I've seen that engaging survivors and for them to tell their stories. And Melissa told the story with tears and other things that will get you emotional. And majority of them got the understanding that there's a need to do more. If there are a lot more of Melissa out there, then men must do more. Also, I think that there are a lot of cultural differences in the work we do. And cultural differences that will make your work more effective, but yet still, we can discuss across board what works for who and the support they can get to be able to do their work. That should be a very uh, fine and better way to go. Bjorn, do you have a remark? Um, I mean, <sighs> I, I guess it's more of a question and I think, you know, I wonder about how to engage men in the long term and what stops that. I think that's the question that's been going through my head um, a lot recently. Um, how do we make sure that once men are engaged, um, you know, because we have seen reports and mentions of that this being a time where you know, this might be quite a good time to engage men, but how do we keep them engaged when, you know, the newspaper articles die down, it's not in the media anymore, um, other things that might be happening in their lives get in the way. And I think, you know, how do we keep that as a priority for them has been on my mind quite a lot. So, um, yeah, that's, I guess, what I, I wanted to finish with. That, and that's a very good point, Jorn. It's it's remaining um, it's it's remaining connected, isn't it? And remaining focused and staying, and, it, and not just responding to headlines, because most people can respond to horrific headlines. Most people, but 
in terms of building a movement, it has to be something that's very deeply internalized and that is carried forward in a daily practice. So that's why it's so important that we can have um, contact and in, in in connection with each other. So I, I, you know, thank you very much for organizing tonight. I think it's been really important. And I'd very much like to stay in touch with uh, almost everybody who's, <laughs> who's taking part, probably the ones who are abusing me for their, for their own political reasons. That's fine. But I'd love to do more. So I'm, I'm, just call me anytime. I'm going to start drawing the event to a close now because we've got a very important uh, another event on and starting at seven and we need a little bit of time to turn around. But I'm just going to end with a couple of remarks. Um, unless any other speakers got any final remarks. I just want to echo what Michael said as well. Thank you. Thank you for organising this. Um, thank you to everyone uh, for talking. It's been it's been wonderful. And um, together, I think we can we can help bring some positive change. So thank you. Bravo, Mike. Let me say, let me say a big thank you to the organisers. Chris, yourself, and uh, my other friend for organizing this and also bringing us into it to share the perspective from another continent. I think that that's also quite different and very important. So it's, 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 it's nice being here, listening to you, and also mm -hmm. sharing our own point of view. I am grateful for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you, Derek. Really good. Hopefully, we'll do, we'll do more together. Okay, then finally, I'd just like to say, uh, it's a quote from Facing Patriarchy by Bob Peace, who set up White Ribbon in Australia, or was working in White Ribbon Australia. Each time an incident of men's violence against women is enacted, men could have made it less likely that that would have happened because we create a culture which tolerates it. Silence is not an option. We've got to take a stand we've got to speak out and i went to a conference a couple of days ago um and the conference title was how do we end not manage men's violence against women and girls mm. and for me that's where i'm going and you know we've got to try harder it is our responsibility we must not give up thank you very much for the people listening um I'm sure there's lots of discussions we could keep going with, with members of the panel, with us at Engage Conference. And it's a good start to our weekend of presentations and discussions. Please join us on as many of those as you can. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>